future, talk radio will actually educate, inspire, and make you think. The future is now. Topics and music that affect your life from Universal Broadcasting Network. Tune in at ubnradio.com. Welcome to the National Safe Child Show, addressing the health, safety, and welfare of all children nationwide. Because it shouldn't hurt to be a child. Here is your host, Tammy Stefano. 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 Hey, folks, welcome to the National Safe Child Show. Thank you for joining us today. We have an incredible show today, as always. This, this situation seems to be never ending. We've been covering the movie, the film, I should say, or the movie, Vaxxed. And I want to, before I begin this episode, encourage people, if you have not seen the movie addressing the CDC cover-up, the name of it is Vaxxed, V-A-X-X-E-D. I suggest that you look online, go to vaxxedthemovie.com, and check it out, see if it's playing in your area. This is an important film. Um, so I just want to remind people of this. Today, we're going to start a series, and we're starting the series off by introducing a mom, a mom of four lovely children. Um, her name is Lisa Mitchell. She has been through years and years of fighting a system that she alleges has destroyed her bond with her child, has damaged her child's health, and has been more corrupt, and has disregarded um, the safety of children. And we all know the entity that I'm speaking of, Child Protective Services, otherwise known in Colorado, where this family had these horrific things take place, um, DHS, the Department of Human Services. So I'd like to introduce, if I have her with us now, Lisa Mitchell. Lisa, are you with us? Yes, Tammy, thank you. Thank you so much for, for joining us today on the National Safe Child Show. Why don't you um, introduce yourself briefly to the audience? Um, go ahead. I'll give you center stage for a moment. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Lisa Mitchell, and I'm a mother of four beautiful children. Uh, my youngest child, son has a disability, and this is what this topic is going to be about was his disability and his disability was treated more like a mental health issue. So for years and years, he really wasn't getting the proper uh, brain injury treatment uh, that he should have, that he did deserve to have and which led to pretty much of a 12 year nightmare that we have been through as a family. Uh, Samuel being my last child, uh, came very fast. I was actually having him in the car. I made it to the hospital. I was told to wait till the doctors uh, showed up. And I was trying to tell my body to stop having him. Um, by the time that I was having him, he was in distress. Uh, the umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck. Uh, twice is what uh, the report says. And his heart rate had dropped twice in that incident. Um, it was reported that I had a cesarean, which I did not. I had all my children natural. Uh, but um, once once we got him home and years started, you know, progressing, about the age of three, I started noticing he had problems that my other three didn't have. Um, I'm not a doctor. I don't know what, what those problems were. But, um, you know, we, you know, we pretty much... I mean, me as a single mother at that time, I was divorced at that time, was trying to um, figure out what to do to help him. And the years progressed. It started really accumulating when he started school. Having I didn't know in the t at that time he was having trouble learning in school. Uh, we were trying to figure out um, what the learning 
problem was. And it was suggested that I go to a psychiatrist, and, and which I did. I went to a psychiatrist. Okay, I want to stop you for a moment, Lisa. Sure. Okay, just to kind of rein it in, because you know your story so well, and and we want the listeners to really grasp um, this 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 story. Mm -hmm. You have four children, ranging in age from twenty five years old now to eighteen. Your your Samuel that we're discussing today is eighteen now, correct? Correct. That's correct. Okay. He has his umbilical cord wrapped around his neck because you're waiting for a doctor to come. But your children, your other three, did they have any disabilities? Do or do they? Or did they ever? Uh no. The the only thing that we discovered in my youngest daughter was that she was uh that she has celiac disease, but that's not but that's not a, a, a dis you know that's not a disability and definitely not a mental you know mental health right. issue. So, okay. No. But but you've never dealt with any type of disability, correct? That's correct. I don't even remember going to school uh, with anybody that you know had a brain injury or anything like that. I don't remember any being being subject or being around people that you can't see what's wrong when you look at the person. I mean, some people with disabilities, you can, it's visible, right? But right. a brain injury is not necessarily visible. Right. Absolutely. Now you had, um, something that we, that we touched on briefly was Samuel's vaccinations. Yes. <laughs> let's, let's touch on that for a brief moment, if you will. Because that well, happens. You. That happens when they're quite young. No, uh, that's correct. And and you know, back in when he was little, Samuel was born in 1997, and I was faithful. I mean, I did all the things that you're supposed to do: the well baby check, you know, the vaccination. He had all his shots. Um, but as we progressed, and I started getting all of his records. Uh, which I do want to mention, they were court ordered to be given to me and uh, they were not given to me. Uh, I started looking at his vaccination and he started he was getting some really odd vaccinations. He had a couple of series of Garnacil shots, which we know, we know about the Garnacil shots now. And he also got tetanus shots, sometimes three, between three and six months apart as we progressed in our story, because he was in a treatment center and he was being bitten by okay. other children. I want to stop you. I want you just to take my lead so that we can tell a story that's not, I, I know you have so much to tell, but if the listeners don't understand, then we're not really getting your story across. So he has a lot of vaccinations when he's a child, when he's a baby. And you're following Correct. this schedule. Because that's what people do, right? That's correct. Okay. By the time that Samuel is six years old, you decide that he gets very frustrated um, and you want some help. You want to understand how to be able to deal with the frustration to better help your son. Isn't that right? That's correct. I mean, that's what you told me. I'm looking at my notes right now. So um, you go to your first appointment. You make an appointment. You find uh, a, a psychiatrist, and you go to this appointment, and you feel good because a professional, medical professional, is going to help resolve, resolve this, correct? Correct. Okay. But what happened instead? When you walked out of that medical professional's office, um, what did you have in your hand after? And, and tell us how long you were there. Um, we, the appointment was probably no more than 30 to 40, 40 minutes approximately. And I walked out of the facility with six psychotropic um, prescriptions for him. Six psychotropic prescriptions after 40 minutes during one visit. 
correct? Correct. Did this doctor, um, I know that you said that the doctor spoke with you quite a bit because she had to get, you know, history and, and, and hear from you. Did she ever test Samuel? I mean, she's giving out these prescriptions and not just one prescription, but six to a six year old. Did they do any testing? No, not at all. No blood work. No, no, uh, height, weight, none of that. No. Okay. But you walk out with six different prescriptions and you're on your way to the pharmacy because you're trusting the doctors. But you mentioned to me that you, you were befuddled at this because your baby six years old, no testing, no blood work, no psychological exams. And, and they're just writing these prescriptions, but you ultimately trusted what the doctor suggested and you got the prescriptions filled. That's, that's correct. But I was crying to the pharmacy. <laughs> yeah, I know. And <laughs> you start, you start giving your son these, these six different psychotropic drugs. Can you tell the listeners um, a couple of the different, <clears throat> excuse me, names of the drugs that, that Samuel was given during this first appointment at six years old? Um, unfortunately, I don't have the list in front of me uh, right now, but I can give um, an estimate. Lexapro, Quantidine, Abilify, Depakote, that's what's that three or four um, uh, um, um, so, uh, let's see Selexa yeah um, um, also I'm trying to think there was um, that's okay I mean that's enough He's right six years old just, he never had any testing done after no, he started taking these medications did you see a positive change in him? I mean, that's why the doctors give him these medications so that they can help your situation. That's why you went there. Um, what happened? What happened to his behavior after he's taking this, this cocktail of, of psychotropic drugs? I would say that his condition was very, very bad. Um, he, he was hallucinating. Um, he was uh, more of a mess where everything would turn into just a crying meltdown. Um, he also at times was just could not calm down. It's though he was just hyper, just could not calm down um, at all to the point where he would just go uh, to the point that he was almost into a state of, ma of mania. Um, and then he would be so exhausted from his mania that he would collapse. Okay. Did you go back to this doctor and say, I think something's not right here. He's collapsing. He's, he's worse off. And the point to us coming is to, to assist, but this is not assisting us. That, that's correct. I, I went, I had to go back to her every month. Um, but it was really t in the two months when I really started noticing he was getting very, very bad, but they fill the prescriptions for just a month or a, a month worth. And I went back and I would tell her the new, the, the new problems that he was having. I'm sorry. Hold on. Okay. Am I back with you? Yes, I'm still here. Okay. I I lost you for a moment. Okay. Repeat that last that last part again. So they give you a thirty day supply and I'd have to go back every month, of course. Right. Because that's what I was told to do. You need to come back in a month to get the new prescription or see what other changes we need to make. Right. And of course basically I did that. Um, I, I told her the, the problems that I had never seen before, um, but she, and, and she switched the meds. So, so every month the meds got switched, either the doses went up or the doses went down or she abruptly stopped what she was giving him and put him on something else. But she never actually took him off. I mean, there wasn't like this, 
this period that he was on and then she says okay it's not working he's having these these um, episodes and we're going to start to wean him off now that wasn't the case she was no, just no that wasn't the case she was switching around right right she was yes, shuffling that's correct. Shuffling psychotropic drugs with a six-year-old to find a cocktail that might or might not work. But did, right. did, did, did you ever see any success with this cocktail mixture that she was sub prescribing? No. In, in fact, I never, ever had to take him to a psych hospital. But after he got on the medication for the first time in my life, I'm taking him to a psych hospital. Samuel, at eight years old in 2003, through, through suggestion of trusted medical professionals, because you're searching, because you want to help your child, um, they suggested that you put him into a treatment center, is that correct? Or did you, did you finally say, he needs some help? I want to wean him off of these drugs. Tell us about 2003 when he was eight years old. Well, in 2003, he was six still. Um, and I'm checking him in. Oh, I'm sorry. 2005. Different. I'm sorry. 2005. That's fine. Uh, in 2005, he had been in and out of psych hospitals. Um, and I... Was and the drugs were constantly changing. Nothing ever changed about that. Uh, you know, the doses would go up and down and all around, and new ones would be introduced, and old ones were still there, but then some of them, I don't know. It was a mess. So he was such a mess by the time he was eight that I made a conscious decision that I was going to get more intensive help than taking him to a psych hospital, going back to the psychiatrist. And I researched a treatment facility in Colorado and uh, went out with my father twice to look at the facility. And at that point, I had no other choice. I, I felt that I needed to get him extensive 24-hour care, not um, the hospital stays are probably about, a, what, a 27 our hold, something like that. Right. Um, and I placed him in that facility. I placed him on my own accord in a treatment center uh, without DHS's involvement. Okay. And at this point, the state was not involved because you, you're you taking care of your son. You're trying to figure out what's going on. He's in this facility now from November 2005 until October 2007. Correct. Right. Okay. Um, let me see. The facility, do you recollect the facility's name? It was called the Kathleen Painter Littler Center, and it's been closed now. It's been closed now. Um, they lost their funding, isn't that correct? That's correct. Okay. So typically, folks, if a treatment center is working, for children and there is success, they continue to get funding. As we very well know, the funding is rampant, quite, quite frankly. Um, it has to be such egregious scenarios that cause any treatment facility around for a significant amount of time to lose their funding. But this treatment facility, the Kathleen Painter Lettler Center, treatment center, did lose its funding and closed its doors. From That's there, correct. from there, Samuel was not getting better. It's two years, and as a matter of fact, um, he's getting worse. And you, you are, you feel like your hands are tied, and you feel like both of you are being held hostage by an invisible force and you can't figure out what it is as much as you have reached out to a multitude of professionals you cannot find a solution dhs the department of human services out of colorado finally gets involved in 2007. tell us about that 
Um, Samuel was in the Kathleen Painter Littler Center, and Samuel was being brought to my house for a therapy visit by his therapist. He was being put in the car. He did not want to sit in the back seat of the car. Uh, I mean, sit in the, yeah, he, he didn't want to sit in the front seat of the car. And so they pulled him out, out of the front seat to put him in the back seat. A kitchen, kitchen person, personnel came out to help the therapist and they started to do a restraint on him and her car, the therapist car was scratched by Sam during the scuffle and the the cook was scratched during the scuffle by Samuel and they called the police came out to file a report to have the therapist car um her car fixed and her insurance said that they needed a police report the police came out and charged Samuel with third degree assault and he just turned 10 He's 10 years old. He's in the front seat. He doesn't want to go in the back seat. They right. start pulling him using this force with this disabled child. In the scuffle of all of this, there were five people that came out. Isn't that right? Um, there was only two, the therapist and the cook and the woman, the, the cook. She oh, okay. was Wait called from out to help. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. It was another time that they restrained him with five. There's so much to your story. Correct. Okay. So the cook, the therapist, they restrain him. In the interim, her car gets scratched, and, and the therapist presses charges. I'm not certain exactly who pressed charges because nobody at that time would give me a straight answer. I don't know if she did. The cook did or the police did. I don't know the answer to that. I really don't. Okay. So we are under, during my investigation, um, it seems to me that the therapist actually pressed charges and she may have done so just to be able to get her car fixed and justify it to her insurance. I have no idea. Um, but he was charged third degree assault at 10 That's years correct. old. And then I want to add that even though during the third degree assault, she still got to be a therapist, but Samuel was restrained from her. How does that work? <laughs> right. But by this time, DHS had intervened, which is causing you to ask that question right now. How does that work? And, and let's just inform the audience that the reason why you're asking that question is because you went from being in control, being able to ask questions, being able to follow a protocol and, and make adjustments all the while still, you know, abiding by or, or trusting might be a better term, the recommendations of the medical professionals, but you were involved. Yes. But now you're asking this question because when DHS got involved, um, you got eliminated. Isn't that right? I did, even though my parental rights were all intact the entire eight years. You're correct. Did they, did they eliminate you because they alleged that you were causing your son harm? No. No, did they you, never, ever, they, they, would, they would reassure me that nobody's blaming you. No one, no one finds you at fault. But as a mother, when the state intervenes, they take custody of your child. All the while, you're doing everything in your power day after day to try to find resolve and peace for your child. The guilt does take over, and, and you felt like, what have I done wrong? I, I, didn't, I didn't really feel... Like what I did wrong, I was so confused. I, I, I explain it like I feel like I got hit over the head with a bat and I don't know who hit me. <laughs> I don't know what happened to us, why it happened, why this had to happen. After they take control of your son, did your, and, and this is at 10 years old, did your relationship with your son start to change? Yes. How so? 
Well, before, when, in the in the treatment center that I placed him in on my own accord before DH custody, I could go in and kiss him goodnight. He was very involved. Um, saw him daily. Uh, and then after they took control, they bounced him even further and further and further away from me. So, and it was- folks, just to, just to, you know, let you know, I know sometimes people get nervous when they come on the show. And I've spoken with Lisa now several times at great length. And what she told me, and I actually wrote it down because it was so moving. She said, there was a time when I was involved with my son because I'm his mom and the state didn't inject themselves and you know, sever our closeness, regardless of the disability. And each and every day you went to the hospital, you read him stories, you held him. You went on to tell me, you know, my little boy, he was just a little boy. He said, I love you, mom. And you made sure that you were really supportive of him and put him to sleep every night. He could see you every day. Yes. And once they intervened, there was no more ability, freedom to be able to see your child, to support your child, and to let your child know, I'm here for you, son. We're going to get through this together. You're not alone. Because even though they said, you didn't do anything wrong, we're here to help, what they actually did was they stopped you from being able to see him. That's that's correct. They moved, They kept moving him further and further away. And when CHS gets involved, you you have to work with their schedule. So you have to get approval to see your kid, and you have to. It has to be all set up. And and when they didn't set it up, I didn't get to see him. And when they didn't provide the DHS policy, if parents are involved, the gas cards, I couldn't see him. There was multiple excuses why those those appointments were not faithful and to me religious where I could I could go down there and, and see him no matter where they had placed him in that time frame. Right. Now something else that, that I've left out that I think is important for the audience to know. Mom shows a facility that was close to her that she had easy access to. If something happened, she was in the car and she was over to the treatment facility helping Samuel. But when DHS got involved and and this this uh, facility closed and there were things happening, they actually moved him almost 300 miles from mom's residence. That's correct. And so while you're going through all of this, you know, the funds are diminishing, folks, as anybody in this, in this arena knows, whether it's child custody or any of, the, any of the sort, you get involved with the state and medical professionals and, and you're spending, regardless of how much, you know, financial help you might get. Um, it became very difficult for you financially, time-wise, and then to have the added burden of them having to put in paperwork in order to schedule this almost like a monitored visitation for you, even though you'd done nothing wrong, 300 miles away. How many times did you end up seeing your son, say, per week or even per month after they intervened enough to really cause trauma to your bond with your son on average um, well the first the, the first couple of years i paid for it out of pocket which was which was a total of violation of dhs policy if a parent's involved in their treatment they are to provide a parent gas cards to see the child so i paid for it out of pocket and it was about It was about the third year in when I could no longer come up with $240 a month to drive out there to see him. And the, and the visit started diminishing due to the fact that I was not getting DHS policy 
uh, gas cards and my visit started declining because I didn't have the funds anymore. Um, and that's when it really started impacting the health of my child. My child, and, and a lot of the notes, it would say, uh, mother, mother couldn't make it down here again because she didn't have the money and, and DHS didn't give her the gas cards. And Samuel did not do well. Um, so it, 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 it really started impacting my child's health even more. So he's not seeing his mom now. So he's really feeling disconnected. Eventually, they, they maintain him being on a multitude of different psychotropic drugs. You end up finding out um, that many or some of these drugs, um, they're not FDA approved to be given to children. Isn't that right? That's correct. I, I, found, I found that out in... 2011, when the Justice Department started suing a lot of the pharmaceutical company makers of these drugs, and, and they were suing them for for not they were not approved for children, and they were also suing them uh, for because the drugs were deemed fraudulent, off label, and therefore every state attorney general, including Colorado, was getting reimbursements back to Medicaid. Uh, because the drugs were being billed to Medicaid, and Samuel's disabled, so he's always had, since 2003, Social Security and Medicaid. Right. But he's on this cocktail. You find out that he shouldn't even be taking these drugs that these trusted doctors are given, but you don't have any say because DHS is involved did you ever start seeing any injuries when you visited? Did you ever hear about your son being restrained? Yes. When I would go and I would see him, at times he was covered from head to toe and bruising from the restraints. He still has fragments of God knows what, either dirt, glass, I don't know, whatever, um, whatever, when they do a restraint at him on the parking lot or, or out on the concrete, he still has fragments in his back from the restraints. He's scarred from head to toe. The, the scars are very telling what's all happened to my child. Um, there were times that I'd go see him and he looked like somebody kicked him off of a motorcycle. He had abrasions all over him. He had sprained limbs, um, head concussions. Um, the list just goes on and on. And some of the reports said that he was, he was dehydrated the entire eight years that he was in DHS custody due to the cyphotropic drugging. And also, um, it was reported that he had blue, he had purple testicles, orange urine. There's the, it goes on and on the nightmare of what, what, what happened to him in their care. And yeah. I didn't see in the, a lot of that when I had him in the Littler Center. Okay, I want to stop you for a moment. Folks, I want to read something. There's a fabulous judge, and there are many fabulous judges, but this one in particular was involved in a case that I was involved in. His, he's out of Las Vegas. His name is the Honorable William Voy, V-O-Y. Okay. This is from the Las Vegas Review Journal posted um, this article in 2014, it says, Judge William Voice said he is concerned that staff at um, this particular treatment facility, the same type as we are speaking about that Samuel's, Samuel has been placed in or was placed in, about uh, two hours north of Las Vegas, use mechanical restraints on juvenile offenders held in isolation. Now, I say juvenile offenders, this is in the article, but let's not forget, folks, Samuel has been deemed now a juvenile offender simply because he was afraid to sit in the back seat. So let's not forget that he was charged at 10 years old, third degree assault. Okay, it, the, the article goes on to say, Judge Voy quotes, if a parent did, did that, it would be child abuse probably with criminal charges. 
Bruce Burgess, the superintendent at this particular youth center, told the judge that uncontrollable juveniles have been restrained with handcuffs and leg, leg shackles while in their solitary cells. And the judge's response was, when you treat a kid like an animal, you're going to create an animal. There are other ways of dealing with it without resorting to something that would otherwise be child abuse if it wasn't in an institution. I agree with that. Absolutely. We have a lot of respect for this particular judge. He does great work. Um, and I want to add that the three degree is the third degree assault the charges were dropped before they moved him 300 miles away. And simply to the fact that he was incompetent, he was deemed incompetent seven different times. Okay. Right now, He's scarred from head to toe. He's been on psychotropic drugs since he's been six years old, since the first time you walked into an office. You have filed a federal lawsuit because it was only in about 2011 when you've just been severed from the ability to truly parent your child or at least support him on a daily basis. He's been moved 300 miles away and you're seeing injuries, and, and this kid is crying out for help, and you can't help him anymore because the state has custody of him. Um, you started really looking at these drugs. You see that many of the drugs should never have been given to children, and as a matter of fact, as you delve even further, you discovered that the drug side effects were so severe, and some of the side effects were suicide, violence, um, worsening of, of any of the symptoms in which these drugs were being given in hopes of subsiding. You filed this federal lawsuit. You had an attorney, and you worked with the attorney for a while, but you came to realize that the attorney's not saying all the hell that you and your son have been through, and you finally went in federal court in pro per. And how right. long? How long were you, or how long have you been in pro per in a federal court hearing? I've been proceeding as a pro se litigant for uh, I would probably say about nine months. Have you learned a lot about the law? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I have. I, and actually, it's the best thing that could have ever happened to me because they had to turn over everything to me. And this actually gave, makes my case even stronger because now I have a majority of the record. I've been putting back on the record what was not addressed, correcting the record that was uh, wrong, and also being able to bring up the drugging and the drug really bring up the drugging. And, and the drugging, you came to be able to verbalize to the court after all of this research that this drugging was being forced on your son because there was a point where we all know our bodies, folks, and, and this kid did not want any more drugs, but they began to force this kid to take this cocktail, this this you know, mislabeled or, or black labeled cocktail of psychotropic drugs so much so that they would make him open his mouth very much like, uh, you know, we see in movies to make sure that he is taking every single one. That's correct. And, you know, then, also found, and then also want to add, I also found out during the time that the Justice Department settlement that the psychiatrists at this particular facility that I'm suing were getting pharmaceutical kickbacks to, to you know, uh, pretty much force the drugging on him. They had incentive to, dr to drug him. Well, and that's what we, you know, we did some investigating on what Lisa was saying. And it was incredible. Incredible. Um, some of 
the kickbacks that medical professionals who are prescribing these drugs get. And a lot of the kickbacks for one particular doctor, John Hardy, John T. Hardy, in your case, um, he was getting kickbacks in the amounts of uh, $250,000 from different speaking, so-called speaking uh, engagements that he did for the pharmaceutical company. Isn't that correct? Uh, that is correct. And, and actually, he was working anonymous with the Denver Post, and they started finding me very credible. And they interviewed Dr. Uh, Dr. T. Hardy, John T. Hardy, and found that he was the second to largest psychotropic drugging psychiatrist in the whole state of Colorado. He was making a living off of ensuring that he continued, that Samuel continued to get his medication. That's correct. Folks, how many people right now, how many children are in a situation that you, you've put your child into a treatment center in hopes of helping your child? You are following the doctor's advice because they're the doctor after all. And you're not seeing any improvement. If your child is in a treatment center and you get a very well-versed story from a very kind looking face that articulates this story quite well to you, the parent, about how your child has sustained injuries, please, please look and investigate for yourselves. More children have died in facilities and, and mainstream media doesn't cover this unless it really gets exploited. So you don't hear about the multitude of cases where children die. Congress right. has heard it. I've, I've posted congressional briefings where it's been presented to Congress, but most oftentimes people don't know. And when they see these facilities and their marketing brochures, they look like damn near heaven. But they are anything but, folks. And I'm not saying all facilities are bad. What I'm saying is, Watch and recognize the signs if you do have your child in a facility. Investigate prescriptive drugs that a doctor so easily gives your child. And if in a month's time or six weeks' time you don't see improvements, don't continue to give your child these prescriptions. Speak up. And speak I'm, up. I'm not, yeah. We only I'm have another... Fun. We only have another minute left. I want you... Um, I have to say something really quickly. Go ahead. We have a minute left. Okay. Since I started working with the Denver Post and we started exposing this, in that time frame of exposing everything, my son resided in that treatment center. Remember I told you the original charges of third-degree assault were dropped because of six different incompetencies right over the years right it is during that time frame that the aclu went in and it they found it was founded that they violated uh the isolation policy here in colorado they right. also uh i had another uh i had another organization go in and it was founded that he was abused in that treatment center and then we had filed our federal lawsuit and in that time in that time period my son was accused of a crime he never committed. It's under an appeal. And then he picked up additional charges of mutual assaults with other youth on these drugs. And he picked up another charge for breaking out a window on a hot summer day while he was coming off of the last drug that he's been on. And now my kid is sitting in jail because we opened our mouth because we exposed the corruption, because we got our investigations and they were founded, and, di and DHS didn't have custody any anymore of him. At midnight, when he turned 16, at midnight when he turned 16 um, in June of 2013, okay. a month later, 
that's when he got accused of this crime that's under an appeal. Do I consider it retaliation? Absolutely. Okay. Did he commit? Did he commit the the what the case the the charge that's under appeal? Absolutely not. Are we contesting that he didn't get in a mutual assault with other kids? Absolutely not. We're not, and we're not saying that he didn't break out the window. But I'm I'm asking that question. He's the one in jail for doctors that were receiving kickbacks for for drugs that he took that the Justice Department sued. My kids in jail. That's that's what I'm asking. Why is he in jail? Well, He's not the criminal here. Okay, so um, we do have to. I have to cut you short. Um, the bottom line is, folks, she has a 12-year history. He's been in facility after facility trying to get help. He never had anything other than the therapist saying he scratched her car. And it was only after the ACLU went in and some other folks in organizations started to question and ended up substantiating your allegations of, of okay. improper, just like Judge Voice said, okay, you treat a kid like an animal, you will create an animal. And Absolutely. what finally happened is when they went in, then they had to drum up some charges to justify their yep. illegal, corrupt, and financially incentivized actions. And here you are now calling them out on it. And folks, I do want to mention one more thing, and then we do have to wrap it up. UBN, thank you so much for, for allowing another minute. Um, while all this is going on, your other children, thinking that your son is, is something's really wrong with him, they have now come to an understanding because as you have been unraveling because you've been able to get all these files because you yourself are still understanding you know seeing the light is being shed in other words and, and right. you're finally connecting the dots and you're seeing the Medicare fraud you're seeing yep. the collection of thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars and you're seeing bank accounts open in your son's name. Okay. Yep. Very important. Although they tried like heck to sever your relationship, your bond, it, it ultimately has brought your family to a, a better understanding. And at one point, social services, DHS walked into the courtroom during your federal case. Isn't that right? And they, the, the, they you, walked in. They walked into where I got unlimited guardianship three weeks ago. The DHS custody attorney tried to go in there and intimidate me, and the judge told her that she's now she's free to go. Like you can leave now. You have no jurisdiction here. You need well, to leave. The judge. The judge actually asked them because you asked the judge. I've had enough. I'd like for them to leave. They've injected themselves enough and destroyed, tried to destroy our family. But didn't the judge ask them, why are you here, as a matter of fact? Today? Exactly. And what exactly. was the response? Uh, she said, uh, he asked her if she even has jurisdiction to be here. And she goes, uh, she played stupid and goes, I don't know. And the judge looked at her like, come on, you know, this child is no longer in DHS custody as far as, uh, you know, appointed the way that he was, he's now in DH, D, uh, DYC, another door, an avenue. But it was pure retaliation for her to come show up at our guardian, at my Are guardian. You, we've, got to, we've got to wrap it up. Are you afraid for your son's safety right now? Yes. Yes, because any, at any moment, something terrible can happen to him. I am terrified for him. Why wouldn't I be? We were, we were retaliated against for speaking up, and now he's in jail. Why wouldn't I be scared? What would you like to see happen if something could happen in the next week? What would that be? He, he gets out, and all of, all of his charges are, are dropped, and his record is expunged. Do you think that your son was affected 
by the years and the multitude of psychotropic drugs that he was forced to take. I say yes, but we don't know what kind of ticking time bombs inside of him, including the vaccination. Lisa, give us the website. Um, give us the name because we do have to go. The name of your okay. Facebook page. Okay, my son's Facebook page where you can read all about our story. Go ahead. It's called Innocent Denied. Innocent Denied. Free Innocent. Samuel. Go ahead. Innocence Denied, Free Samuel Mitchell. Okay, and there's also another site. Please give us that link. Um, the other site would be, you can also see our story on medical kidnapping. Medicalkidnap.com did a fabulous article. It really tightens this story up. Um, can people follow your federal lawsuit? Are you offering anybody any advice or, or any support? Not advice, you're not an attorney, but any support to parents who are considering filing a federal lawsuit? Um, I am. Contact if people want to contact, it, contact me, they can contact me on Innocence Denied Free Samuel Mitchell. I've had a couple of parents actually inbox me and trying to get a hold of me and trying to see what we could do to okay. something I could do to help their child. Okay, so Lisa... We will continue to follow your story. I'm, we're praying for Samuel. Um, we want to give a follow-up. We want to let folks know nobody should be on all of these psychotropic drugs. There are alternative solutions. And, and sometimes it's not, you know, um, sometimes that's not the answer, but it is worth taking a real close look, it could save your child years and years of suffering. UBN I Radio, do wanna, I, I, we I do, do have to add something. I do want to add something really quick. Okay, you're going to uh, do it. During the, during the investigations that I did with the, uh, anonymously with the Denver Post, here in Colorado, I formed a psychotropic monitoring steering committee okay. where now, finally, they, can, they look at one drug at a time and then California mirrored that. They just passed a bill that now California is doing the same thing where they're only, if they are giving any of these psychotropic drugs to kids, they're doing it one at a time. And New Mexico has taken it one step further. New Mexico will not sever a parent's rights or, or do anything or take a child into DH custody if the parent says no to these psychotropic drugs. Okay. Thank you so much, Lisa. The federal court has recognized, folks, that DHS is responsible for severing Lisa's bond with Samuel. We're going to keep you informed. UBN Radio, the National Safe Child Show. Watch us next week. We're going to delve into some medical professionals, and let's discuss psychotropic drugs and what they really do to children. Thank you, folks. Keep fighting the good fight and ask questions in a nice way. Um, God bless you and take care. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.